Center for Gas Separations is, is really about can we use synthetic control in materials chemistry to do gas separations more efficiently. And so right now, um, gas separations account for about 10% of global energy consumption. And so something like 10% of the CO2 that winds up in the atmosphere is associated with doing a gas separation. If we could learn how to do those more efficiently, if we can make materials that can help us do those more efficiently, um, then we could have less pollution, less CO2 build up in the atmosphere. Carbon capture would be a way of basically allowing us to continue to use fossil fuels in the near term, but ideally abating a lot of the CO2 emissions that would otherwise arise from their use. And so a big part of what we do is try to understand can we come up with new mechanisms and new materials that could do CO2 capture efficiently um, so that you don't cut into the energy, the electricity being produced in a power plant. One of the systems that we're particularly interested in are metal organic frameworks. This is a, a class of porous materials that basically is built up of a lattice of transition metal ions connected by molecules. This is a MOF powder, a metal organic framework made in powder form, free-flowing powder. Uh, the powder is, uh, is in, in a special form we call microcrystalline. It is a, it's a form that um, we need to characterize the material at the atomic or nano level. There's metal clusters linked by organic linkers, and they're just very porous crystalline materials. But also you can go into the pores and actually covalently change the character of the pores by attaching uh, functionality, metal containing functionality as well as organic functionalities to change the environment of the pores so that you can tailor that particular framework to carry out a specific operation. Or that they can absorb gases more strongly than um, if you were to put them in a tank. So for example, if you were to fill a, a, a gas tank with methane, uh, you could only fit a certain amount in there. But if you were able to put a metal organic framework in there that could absorb methane even better, you would be able to fit more methane per unit volume than in just the tank alone. A typical MOF has a surface area that is above 5,000 meters square per gram. Uh, just to give you an idea what that number means, that's, uh, that surface area is as large as a football field surface area. The materials have a very well-ordered structure. And almost like Tinker Toys, you, can, you have little um, spools with linkers between them, making, you can think of it as a cubic net or something like that. And those linkers, you know, the structure across this material is constant. But you could intersperse different color linkers in the case of Tinker Toys. But in our case, linkers with di slightly different chemical functionalities. And because of that, you, could, you, you now have this material that is well-ordered, but then chemically it's heterogeneous. When we make these materials, the, the different chemical functionalities um, work synergistically to improve the properties of the material as a whole. Um, so for example, there was, if you have a, a metal organic framework of one type with one type of linker and a metal organic framework with a second type of linker, they might both absorb carbon dioxide with different affinities. But if you mix them together uh, in a certain ratio, in fact, the adsorption for carbon dioxide is even higher than either of them combined. One of the particular questions that I'm trying to answer is why nitrogen doesn't get into a particular MOF. This is really important because we want the MOFs to be selective for CO2, which means they need to block nitrogen, block water. So we have a really promising material, and it's difficult to see from experiments why nitrogen doesn't get in. So I have the model that I'm uh, simulating and as it's running I look to see where the nitrogens are going inside the MOF, what the atoms inside the MOF are doing to try to figure out by what mechanism the MOF is blocking nitrogen from adsorbing. As a result of the funding that came out of the CGS um, we were able to take those results and begin to look at some really applied applications teaming up with a small startup um, as part of my PhD work. Um, that enabled us to really go forward and, and, and discover that some of the materials that CGS funded in its earliest stages were actually really some of the most promising and efficient materials for doing carbon capture. And it's a complicated problem, which is why we need you know, scientists who can make materials 
who can measure materials, who can do computational science to understand exactly how they work, how they could be improved. This involves a lot of interplay between the experimental and computational side because they're the ones who make the materials and we can, using our models, try to predict why they behave the way they do and also predict what kinds of materials they can make. Driving those interactions with uh, theory uh, presents a lot of fundamental challenges and by working on this project we have an opportunity not just to you know, develop new materials that you know, c uh, capture CO2 better than those that exist, but we have an opportunity to develop new theory that predicts the properties of any material better than the theory that exists now. Berkeley is a large public university that's had a um, very close relationship with the National Lab, Lawrence Berkeley Lab, um, and this has been a real benefit in terms of um, you know, just up the hill we have this big national lab with things like the advanced light source, like the molecular foundry, the best electron microscopes in the world. Um, and that's been a good advantage for um, doing science, particularly energy related science. Um, and it's led to almost all the areas of science and engineering on campus having uh, advantage and, and um, drawing people from around the world to work here. So my main area um, of activity in the EFRC is to provide insight into how polymers and porous crystals can be married in new types of composite membrane materials. And this means that we um, take advantage of the world-leading expertise in moth materials um, down at UC Berkeley in the groups of Omar Yagi, Jeff Long, and Zhou Zhao and they come up with novel materials that you know really sort of push the limits to what we can do for um, controlling the selective transport of gases in materials. Once we have those materials identified, my group takes them and figures out new ways to process them by combining them with polymers and then controlling the architectures of the polymer and the porous crystal in the final films. And it's through this control over the architecture that we are ultimately able to control how gases diffuse selectively from one side of the membrane to the other. Ideal case is a polymer gives you to be able to generate membrane, you can process it, such a form of plastic, they can roll it up, get into a module. And then the particle the inside there can help to increase the flux and sometimes improve the selectivity. The beauty of what we are doing actually is really related to the recent development. Now they can get the mouth crystals, they can get them into a nanometer size. So this really opened up a lot of possibility. Understanding how to marry the properties of compositionally like different materials and get more than additive gains by combining them. So it's more than the sum of their parts. And metal organic frameworks and polymers are um, one of these pairings that have a broad set of technology applications associated with them, particularly in the clean energy technology space, whether we're talking about carbon capture or other types of selective transport behaviors. In some ways, it's like a, a, an art form. You can create new materials, new structures that um, nobody's thought of before, nobody's seen before. Um, when you do a crystal structure, for example, like Miguel does up at the advanced light source, um, and you see for the first time, here's where all the atoms are, and they're just where I intended them to be. Um, it's incredibly exciting. You realize nobody's, nobody's seen that before. We shoot the crystal with x-rays, and from the x-rays, we get a diffraction pattern. And from the diffraction pattern, we can back out the structure of the material. So it's a lot like taking photographs of the structure of the material and seeing where the atoms are. And because we can see where the atoms are, we can see how where CO2 is inside the structure and what specific spots in the structure does CO2 bind and how does it bind. Because they're so tunable, their functionalities can be changed in such a great way. Um, it's it's possible that there may be applications we have yet to think of and that laying the groundwork for understanding how molecules interact with framework, these frameworks um, will enable us to design materials that we can't even think of yet. I really like this center because it has a really fast feedback loop 
So whatever they do can just direct the feedback into us. But in the meantime, anytime we want to modify the surface, we go to them to you know, understand what, what is available. Not only are you motivated by the science and the context, but you're also motivated by what its potential is to really impact human civilization and its future. And that, I think, is the largest uh, gain that, that we get and really motivates the collaborative spirit um, that we've had. I think solving a fantastic problem like carbon dioxide uh, requires um, the best minds in the world. I think Berkeley has them. It also requires the best materials in the world, and I think Berkeley has those. This is a, this is a, a center that the Department of Energy funds to do basic fundamental science. Um, but we've interpreted that to do fundamental science within the context of a, an applied problem. Um, and I think one thing we do show here is that, that you can do um, new fundamental science um, that's also potentially going to have an impact on, on the world.